everybody. I'm going to talk about the blank slate. Um, kind of from the beginning, I, I am fascinated as a composer with the blank slate um, on many levels. I'm fascinated that a life from the very beginning is blank, and then you build this thing from the very beginning. And by the time we die, we have a whole novel, you know. I love the idea of the blank slate when I uh, go to compose. I love that feeling of I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Um, it's unsettling, but I love that feeling. And I also like working with uh, brand new uh, piano students because they are blank slates. And really, those early moments, um, lots of teachers here, those early moments can make all the difference in how these young students um, perceive their lives, really, not just musically, but creatively, which of course is what I'm committed to. So um, this is about a 90 minute talk that I'm going to do in 25 minutes, so we're going to be <laughs> missing a few things here. But uh, the, basically the message is composing is for everyone. It's not just for uh, creative people, which doesn't really make sense because everybody's creative. Every time you make a sentence, every time you open your mouth and put a sentence together, you're being creative. So we are all there. It's not like we have to aim to be there. We're already there. So we just have to empower um, all ages to feel like they have a voice and they have that, that they're safe to say something. Um, we do that all the time with, with drawing. From the beginning, we have, we have everyone learn to draw. We draw their dog, draw anything, draw their mom, draw their house. Um, and we don't think, oh, yeah, it, you know, someday, this kid's going to be Picasso. We, we have no expectations at all with drawing, but for some reason with composing music, there is this odd expectation that we're supposed to be good. And, and no, we're not supposed to be good. We're just supposed to be who we are. So anyway, I'm going to kind of fly through um, some of the things that we, that we touched upon last year, which was um, basically the idea of when a student first starts to encourage these little two-minute creations before you get into the lesson books, mm -hmm. to allow them to uh, realize that the piano is a toy. It's it's not it's not this thing that you have to do right. It's it's a it's a vista of imagination. So you want to give this message to your students right off the bat. So I do. And we talked about this a little bit last year, but I do things like uh, creating creatures. We sit at the piano bench together, and I'll say, okay, what do you think? What is this? What is this? And then the student might say, oh, it's a bird flying away. Like, now it's your turn. And then the student will hear, what's that? You know. Uh, so we play these games of uh, creating creatures. That's a, that's a very successful way to start. Um, another thing that we do is take journeys together. I, I have a favorite thing, um, which is taking journeys up into space. And I'll say, okay, let's do it. Let's do a rocket ship. And you play. I'm talking, you know, five, six-year-olds or high schoolers. We do this. I do this with all ages. And I'll say, let's take off in a in a rocket ship, and you know. You get to the top, and then you're like, what do you see? And then we make these stories together. Um, let's make comets, or let's make twinkling stars. I usually do this with my students to, again, encourage them uh, to, to think differently about what these white and black things are. And um, I give them assignments. Go home and, uh, and create some fish or, you know, anything. Anything works. Weather is, of course, very, very successful. Lightning, raindrops, thunder, thunder being uh, everybody's favorite. As long as they use their fingers or their hands, uh, and not their elbows, and not their pencils, <laughs> they're not going to do anything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm flying through this stuff. Um, Feelings, of course, is a, is, a, is a very important message to give to the students that um, all feelings can be spoken in sound. So how do you make a sound that's shy? You know, 
know, how do you do it on the piano? How do you make a shy sound? How do you make a, a big, loud, extroverted, I'm here sound? Um, so we, we do these uh, sad things and happy things. And angry things. Um, the empowerment of being able to feel free, being angry, uh, feeling free to be confused. Uh, allowing those things to come out through sound is is a healthy thing. It's it's better than any therapy, I think. <laughs> uh, it, basically, the message is falling in love with sound from the from day one. Um, once I kind of worked on this for a while and and brewed this sense of imagination and and getting out there with with uh, expressing ideas and feelings, but then we get into the composition. But up until now. Um, they haven't put any pencil to the paper. They don't know how to write or conceive of, of notated anything. Uh, but they're, all these things they're learning, they're learning to use the entire piano. They're learning that fast and slow are very different and they feel very different. They're learning softs and louds and the importance of, um, of expression coming through these different dynamics. So many things are happening at these early stages. So. Uh, it's not just playtime. Uh, we learn through play, and that's true for adults too. I learn through play all the time. Um, so then we get to our first composition. Um, a big part of how I teach composition is, is improv is just making it up on the spot. Composition means committing to some kind of notation. But I don't go to the staff first. Um, <coughs> I'm just throwing this in because there are resources now that help with, with composing. You don't have to recreate create the wheel. Kevin and I did the first um, composition workshop series called Music by Me. It's fantastic <coughs> for groups and camps because there's a lot of interaction stuff in the books. Um, Creative Composition Toolbox, which is the one that's uh, through Alfred, which is out on the stand out there. It's more for private lessons getting the students to create every single week. So it's one side of the page is uh, here's a tool and the other side is do the tool. So it's very, very uh, sequential, which many teachers need and many students need, that sense of uh, sequential learning. Uh, Wednesdays with Banana is just a video series that came out uh, about a year ago and it talks about a lot of things that I'm talking about now, which is getting the students to getting anyone to feel free about creating a piano. So if you're interested, just Google it and come up. Um, the gifts of composition, I don't, I'm pre preaching to the, to the choir here, but uh, I do have a story. Um, I have this student, her name is Serena, she's now just graduating from high school, but uh, when she first came to me, um, she knew that I was a composer and um, so, like her second lesson, she brought a packet of stapled um, paper with drawings all over it. And I said, well, what's this? And it had a title, it was The Bully. And uh, she, she said, well, it's my composition. I, I want to play my composition for you. And I'm like, well, composition? Okay, cool. <laughs> so I took it to the piano and she was very committed to every page. There were like 30 pages. She was going to sit down and it's just pictures with a couple little notes on there. And she'd go, oh, the bully, he ran across the schoolyard. And then the bully made a face at me. And then the bully, he chased my friend away. And then all this time she's turning the pages very carefully. <laughs> it took a long time. This took like half our lesson. And she's the bully. And, and at the end, she said, uh, the bully doesn't like me. And then, the, and everything was in reds and blacks, and the very final page was all blues and greens, and she said, but I like myself. And she did this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we do composition. You know, it, it's, it's about, uh, it's about uh, being who we are. Through sound. Um, the scariest thing as a teacher, I know, is committing to making the leap into composition because 
our, uh, we don't, 30 minutes isn't enough. 45 minutes isn't enough. An hour isn't enough. There's just not enough time to do this. So what I want to really express is that this can take three minutes because composition is something that students do at home. So all you have to do is give them a little tool and say, here, let's have you just make a piece this week that uses these three notes, <coughs> or these three notes, or these two notes. And just go home. It doesn't have to be the same every time, but we just I just want you to, to do that. So that takes less than a minute to say that to them. You write it in their assignment notebook, and you're done. They come back the next week, and you can I hear your composition? And they're like, well, I didn't do it. So then <laughs> we'll go home and go home and do it. That took about what ten seconds. So I mean, the, the assignment process of, of composition is very easy. You give a tiny, tiny tool that they can incorporate into their concept of, of creation, and this and this goes for older students too. Um, go home and and write something based on a flavor cadence. Go home and write something on. Um, that, that is a programmatic concept of what you think wind is. You can, you can do this without any series, but um, of course there are series that, that help you with this. It doesn't take, doesn't take long. Um, I've been doing this since I first started teaching, and that was a long time ago. And nobody else was doing it, but I figured that's always what I did when I was a kid, so why not give this to my students? And, um, Every third recital has always been original compositions. So uh, if you think of it as normal, then it's just normal and it's not, it's nothing, nothing special. I, I, I think we need to take music down to not special anymore. It's, it's like democratizing it and taking the, the giants out of it and just making it accessible to everyone. Um, the student goals is just to create something cool and, um, and to write it down in some manner. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about that notation process in a second. Um, the teachers is just, the teacher goal is just to figure out what the assignment is, make it specific. So uh, go home and write something based on C and D. And then when they come back, make sure that they did it based on C and D. And then praise them. And then you're ready for more. I, I talk a lot about the importance of quantity. Quantity is really important with composition because it's like talking. When a two-year-old learns to speak English, they have to chatter. Even if nobody understands them, you chatter. You chatter through composition. You do lots and lots of it. And then all of a sudden, you get the idea of what you like the most and, how, and what sounds you like the most. And your musical taste begins to develop. But it takes it takes many years to figure out what you really, really love sometimes. And that's the quantity part of it. And the quality comes with time. So uh, don't worry about quality. It's a hard thing to say. Yeah. Don't worry about quality. <laughs> OK, non-traditional notation. This is, this is a big one. Um, I do a lot of composition residencies across the country, encouraging students to compose, encouraging teachers to compose, and encouraging teachers to teach composition. I'm going to California uh, in a couple weeks to do this with a whole conservatory of teachers. And one of the biggest things that I say at the get-go is forget the staff for now. Just get your ideas out so that they're the same every time you play them. Um, get it out in some way that makes sense to you. What The way that I've designed, and it's in my first book of the Creative Composition Toolbox, is can I do this? No, I can't do this. Um, if you look at this, if you turn it this way, it's just notebook paper. And if you turn it sideways, you've got a line through the center. If you draw it, or some little steno pads already have a line through the center. Anyway, if you have this, then this is low, this is high. You can do many notes at the same time if you keep them in the same column. The only thing really missing from this is rhythm. And the students can write little notes to themselves. Maybe they'll have a little slashes or something to help them remember the rhythm. Rhythm is, is a very strong memory, at least for me. And I think for most people, rhythm usually comes back quicker than notes do. So um, using something that's non-traditional so that they can get it down quickly 
doesn't matter if you understand it as the teacher, but what matters is that when they look at it, they know what they meant to do, and they're able to play it. So they make that connection between writing it down and playing it the same each time, which is not really the message of this particular <laughs> festival. But um, there is some value to, to um, being an architect as a musician. I, I like to think of that maybe if I had an alternate thing that I did, I think I'd be an architect. Um, because I like, I like putting things together in particular ways and watching them grow and become something um, in a systematic way. I like that. And there are a lot of, a lot of students who really, really connect to that. OK. Um, where does this take the students? Um, if you have something like this, I think I may have done this last year. Last year, I can't remember what I did last year. I have no memory of it last year. So this is the beginning of spider monkey stories. Um, I like to give this example because it's so extreme. I have uh, one student, she's now grown up, but her name was Amanda. And when I gave her this, she, she's a I have to do things right kind of girl. And she did this. And then came back down. The spider monkey went up the tree. Do another one. My other student, Dalton, who I still have, and he's still absolutely as nuts as he ever was. Um, <laughs> honestly, I hope you don't have a Dalton. A <laughs> <laughs> Dalton? Did, no, I, I, I actually adore Dalton. Down and I said, well, what's happening in the story? And he said, well, the, the, the spider monkey climbed up the tree and he ate a whole bunch of bad bananas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then he, and then he got sick to his stomach and then he, he barfed and then he, and then he fell out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so he said, how do I write this down? And I said, well, what, what part is that? And he's like, that's it. he's chomping on the bad bananas. And I said, well, how many bananas did he have? He had seven bad bananas. And so we put seven, and then we made a little mouth, mouth, and then, of course, a big arrow down for the, for the glissando. So um, these kids, it's so much fun, and it's really, really great to have them play for each other because they all create something completely different. Um, repeats and patterns. Um, this is a big one. We've been talking about them this weekend, actually, uh, about the presence of sequences, the presence of, of patterns. It's okay to do things more than once. Big, big message to students. Um, so that's just, I put that up there because it's an important thing to teach them at every level. Um, I also like to bring in the music of the week. So if I'm working on, if I focus on a particular tool and say, OK, today's tool is range, use the whole piano. Then we'll go to uh, something that they're actually assigned. And I'll say, hmm, it's interesting. This piece is only in this position. Is there any way we can use our composition tool and do something different with this? Let's, let's see what happens if we take it down to the bottom of the piano. What happens? How does it change it when we take it to the top? So I will extend the lesson into their real music so that they understand that composition isn't a separate category. I hate that composition is a separate category. It should be all encompassing in the, in the whole lesson. It's about the whole thing. Um, I also like group experiments. I do groups once, about once every month, sometimes every six weeks. And sometimes you can take a concept like the importance of musical markings. We all know what it's like to teach students who do everything perfectly, but they see nothing other than the notes and the rhythms. And it's so important to give them the sense that it really, truly changes the music. So uh, one of my favorite group experiments is to uh, white out. If anybody ever has white out anymore, I still have white out. <laughs> so you take, a, you take a piece and you, take, you white out all the musical markings. And you say, OK, you can take this. Everybody in the group, take it home. 
put your own musical markings. You can use APAs, you can use staccatos, accents, dynamics, anything you want to. And then I want you to practice the Dickens out of it. And then you have a little group concert and everybody does their version, only changed by musical markings. And they sound like completely different pieces. And then you're like, that's why you need to notice the musical markings in your piece. It, it, isn't, it isn't just about the notes. Okay. Uh, syncopation is always kind of a barrier because all students are so very, very comfortable with syncopation because it's in all the pop music. And that means that a lot of the notation gets really, really difficult when you get into syncopation. What I do with this is I teach one syncopation at a time. So bum, ba dum, ba dum, bum, bum, ba dum, ba dum, bum. And then you do a whole piece based on that particular syncopation and you help them notate that particular rhythm so that they get how to do that rhythm and you teach them one rhythm at a time, maybe two rhythms at a time, uh, so that they can learn to, to take that, that step on. Um, at this point, of course, I'm into um, like a, the second or third book, I think second book, um, of the series, which again is, uh, uh, actually what I did on this, what you're seeing here, is the left side is the, is the, is the exercise in the book where they're doing, dum, what is it, da 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 and then again pulling in, this is, this is syncopation in their music. So again, connecting the, the music versus the syncopation that they're creating. Um, themes, the kids love themes. As I mentioned, I do recitals based on themes. Um, this was, uh, this little guy uh, was in a group of boys who chose natural disasters as their theme. <laughs> and he was, yeah, real ones. And they put, brought in pictures. They made a big poster of all the pictures of all these natural disasters. I think that Parents really were worried about me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> we, got the, we got the hurricane, we got the earth, we got the typhoon. They were all getting into it. And, um, they were very, very cool compositions. So, um, anyway, uh, also bringing in ideas, um, making making composition connect to things like dance, uh, connecting it to art, uh, bringing all the arts together through their music, it is a wonderful, wonderful experience for the students to create something and then maybe draw something uh, that goes with it. Um, I've had a lot of dance uh, pulled into my recitals. If you have talent within your studio, this guy uh, plays the viola, this person is a dancer, this person loves to uh, do the baton. baton. Does anybody do the baton anymore? <laughs> Juggle, you know. Uh, we had a couple of jugglers in my studio, and we, uh, I had we did some music, creative music, and they juggled with it. And you know, there there are many ways to to bring more things to work other than just the sound, and it, it makes it more meaningful. The more art that you weave together, um, 